So assignment two, which is due in on, let's get you excited, <laughs> November. <laughs> assignment three is January. This is next assignment is due on the 26th of November. So another four weeks, it's due in again. So every four weeks, you're going to hand something in to me. But it doesn't have to be big. Remember, it doesn't have to be huge. It has to be four weeks worth of work. So please, I want you to bear that in mind. <clears throat> the marking for all these assignments is exactly the same. Every task is worth five marks. And the way it works is you've, you've just done the bare minimum to get through. You get three marks. If you try to get things a bit further and be a bit more inventive and creative and, and technical, you get four marks. If it's getting almost professional level, really quite cool, you know, quite, quite nice, you get five marks. If you don't complete it all, so some bits didn't work, you get two marks. And if you made a kind of a token effort to do it, you get one mark. Okay, so it'll be a bell curve. I'm expecting most people to hit three, two, three and fours, with a scattering of ones and fives. Hopefully no ones. Everyone's had a good go at this. <coughs> For this next assignment, the coursework submission is almost the same. There's the report to complete that you've been working on. And this time, because it's a website, you're going to zip it up and either upload the zip file or you're going to give me a link so I can download it. If you give me a link, be very, very careful because when I look at your file, if I see the date modified is after the deadline, I will not accept it. So don't be tempted to go back in and do a few more changes the next day. <clears throat> Once it's on Dropbox or wherever, do not touch that file because the date modified will show and you must, you know, I need to know you did it by the deadline. <clears throat> this assignment is called Building Websites. And this is what we're going to be doing for the next four weeks. <clears throat> the... Okay, Building Websites, four steps. You're going to be working with HTML and CSS. So the, uh, some of you who have done website design before will be familiar with, with the technology, but I'm going to show you some important issues about semantics and how we use the different technologies. <coughs> now, list of items, detail view. Here we are, look. Two of the three views, you're going to start mocking up in HTML and start to build, <coughs> build some pages. And... We're also going to have a shared style sheet between the two pages. So we're going to link to a single style sheet between the different pages that we create. That's the first task. That's nice and easy. List of items, detailed view, no layout stuff at all at this point. Simply the content and the structure of your web page. And I'll explain that in a bit more detail. Um, task two is where we do layouts using style sheets. And task two is really interesting because you're not allowed to change your HTML. You're going to take your simple web page design and produce a nice multi-column you know, banners, footers and everything else without making a single change to your HTML file. We're going to do everything for layout through, through CSS, through style sheets. <clears throat> so think about that when you're working on the first task. The third one, we're going to look at navigation and styling navigation using CSS. So we look at buttons, rollovers, menus, all these sort of technologies. And the fourth one, we're going to have a little timeout of simple web page design and we're going to look at micro data and search engine optimization. So we're going to tag our data so when Google searches for it, it can extract the information. You know how you have this little picture of someone when you, when you search for reviews? It comes with their picture and their profile picture. I'll show you how that's done. <clears throat> Things like dates, we're going to embed dates and put tags around them so Google knows when it was published. We're going to have ratings. So when you go to the search results page, you can see ratings and things. So your review site will not just be a good review site when people are in there, but when people search for products, it'll come up with your reviews and your ratings in the search results. And then as part of that, we're going to look at search engine optimization, how we optimize our websites to make them easy to find for the different search engines. <clears throat> so there are four tasks. So as you can see, it's a completely different pace, isn't it? It's a completely different pace than the first assignment. So if you're into code, you'll enjoy this more. <coughs> but even if you're into graphics, I think you should find this quite interesting because doing your layouts, getting really good layouts to work with CSS is quite challenging. <coughs> so does that second assignment make some sense to you? Can you see where you're going with this? 
you see what you've got to produce. By the end of the second assignment, you will have a static website. You'll have a website which looks as if it's all working, and it is all working in terms of the pages linked together, but there's no animations, there's no transitions, there's no data behind it. There's no database behind this, this will be static pages. Your third assignment, you're going to build a database and populate your website with data from a database. All right? The fourth assignment, we're going to look at animations, transitions, JavaScript. Uh, we're going to look at form validation, all those sort of techniques. And then the fifth assignment, that's all JavaScript. The fifth assignment, we're going to look at WordPress and how we work with WordPress and build sites using WordPress. Because I think that's important that you, you know. So are there any questions about this at the moment? <laughs> I have to say, you are amongst friends here. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask them, because I can guarantee whatever question you ask, half the class will be thinking the same thing. <clears throat> so if you've got questions about the assignment or you're not clear on something, speak up, and I will do my best to answer you, make sure you know what you're doing. Yes? Um, what program are you writing on? Notepad, Crystal, Crystal? The code editor, very good question. Um, everyone has their preferences for editors. The answer is, it doesn't matter, but I know that the university has Notepad++ installed, they've got Dreamweaver, which I tend to avoid like, like the plague, and Komodo Edit, which is one of my favourites, because you can edit remote files, there's like an FTP thing built into it. You can use Notepad if you wanted to. All that matters is you don't use something like Word. <laughs> <coughs> it's got to be a code editor that saves in plain text formats. Beyond that, you can use anything you want. I mean, there's Sublime Ed, Text Edit, there's all sorts out there. And I would, I would su suggest that you experiment, you download all these free and open source editors, have a play with them, and see which one you prefer. Because different people have different preferences, don't they? Do you have any preference yourself? No. Okay, you stick with Notepad++, that's absolutely fine. Okay, so HTML and CSS. So the idea is, after this lecture, you need to understand the structure of an HTML5 document. We're going to use HTML5 which is the latest version. Now, it's finally getting into mainstream. If you design a website nowadays, you should really use the latest version of HTML. We're going to use HTML5 elements to define the structure of a page. It's vitally important you use the correct tags in the correct way to create a page structure, because then when you come to your second task, the structure translates into layout. If you don't get the structure right, it's not going to work. And we're going to use CSS to improve the type of graphic appearance just how the text looks, the colours, the basics of CSS. We're not going to cover layout, that's next week. <coughs> so here is a typical HTML5 page. <coughs> and what you'll notice, first of all, is if you ever use early versions of HTML, this doc type definition, which tells you which version of HTML is in use, it got really long at one point, HTML4 and XHTML got really long, complicated strings you had to memorise. It's simply doc type HTML. They've got back to basics. You must specify a language, and this is called an attribute, which applies it's inside the HTML tag. This is a language attribute, because Google is multinational, and different countries return different results based on the, uh, on the tags. Okay, let's give up on that one. <coughs> <coughs> then, if we look at the head section, the head tells us, gives us metadata about the page. This doesn't display in the page itself. This isn't part of your page content. This is extra information to help the browser. And the first thing you notice is this meta tag, which we'll talk about in week four. Char set UTF-8, which tells it this character set that this web page is using is UTF-8. Okay? It's a standard character set. You know, you get this funny question marks in boxes sometimes when you look at some pages and you know, little bits that go wrong on the page and boxes and that's because it hasn't been defined properly and then we have this title tag and what you notice about some tags is some tags only have an opening tag and you see that meta tag only has an opening tag but this title tag has an opening tag and it has a closing tag so some tags only have opening tags and some have opening and closing if it only has an opening tag, it has this funny little forward slash character. Okay? And that tells the browser there is no closing tag. <clears throat> the main part of the page is this body section. There's the body tag. At the bottom, there's the end of the body tag. And everything between the body tags is what gets displayed in the 
section of the web browser. That's the bit you see. The title comes in the Chrome, you know, the, the bar at the top of the screen. And also, if you bookmark a web page, that's the name it gives to the bookmark. Whatever you put in the title is used when the page gets bookmarked. <coughs> so we have a pair of article tags. And what you, what you may also have noticed is tags are nested. In other words, the heading one tag is completely inside the article tag, isn't it? It's nested completely inside. If that's the heading tag and that's the article tag, they go inside each other. They don't overlap. You wouldn't close the head and then do the uh, close the body, then do the heading one closing tag. Some tags are what we call block level tags. A heading tag is a block tag. When you display a heading on the screen, it occupies a box of space, and the next thing goes underneath it. Whereas some tags, like <coughs> that tag, that image tag, see the image there, that's called an inline tag. Another inline tag is this tag, an EM tag, an emphasis tag. Because what you don't want to do, that makes it go bold, you don't want it to go bold, go to a new line, do the bold bit, then go back to another line, do you? You want it to flow inside the, inside the paragraph. So we have block level tags and we have inline tags. And when we come on to next week's session, when we do style, we're going to use them in particular ways. And the, the, next week when we talk about menus and navigation, we're going to change the way they work. We'll turn block into inline, we'll turn inline tags into block tags to get our navigation to work properly. <clears throat> what you'll also see is attributes. There's an image tag and can you see I've got a source equals and an alt equals. Those are called attributes and those supply additional information for the tag. So this says if the image doesn't display, you should display that text and this says that's the source, the file that we want to display in the image tag. And you saw that here, didn't you? The meta tag, the char set was the attribute. And so any more? Image source, there we are, there's a link, look. An anchor tag, that creates a link. href, the href attribute tells us where the link should go when we click on it. So there's also hidden attributes in the, in the HTML to make things easier to, uh, for the browser to render them. And that's how that opens. So there's the code, and that's how it looks. And as you can see, the block tags, everything jumps to the next line, whereas the inline tags, look. So I beg your pardon, that emphasis was italic, strong is, is bold. You can see, look. And the other thing to look at is some special symbols. Look at that one. At sign pound, semicolon. At sign amp, semicolon. Those are special characters that the browser cannot display. They display wrong because they have special meanings. So with special characters, we have to use a special code, which starts with an ampersand sign and ends with a semicolon. And then that tells the browser to display an ampersand sign there and to display an ampersand sign down there and to display a pound sign, sterling sign, just there. So you need to be aware of those special characters to display special, uh, special codes for special characters. So you can see, six, there's the pound sign there, and there's the ampersand sign just there. So those special code characters allow us to display illegal, illegal uh, symbols. <clears throat> so, semantic HTML. In the olden days, as you probably saw from your first assignment, people just slapped in HTML to make things look nice. They use HTML to, to change the appearance of a page. That is completely wrong. <clears throat> HTML defines the structure of a page. That's why we have a strong tag and not a bold tag now. Strong means it's, it has to be stronger. Uh, what else do we have? We have, a, we have a, a paragraph tag to display a paragraph. We have the list tag to display a list. We have a table tag to display a table. These tags don't define how the table or the list looks. They just say, we want a list. It's up to the style sheet to change the way it looks. So if you look at plain HTML, it's, it's really boring. Plain HTML just is, is Times New Roman, black writing, lots of space between paragraphs, so a topography, typographically it looks absolutely, absolutely terrible, but it, display, it, it contains a structure of the page. 
we want a heading, then we want a paragraph, we want a, a list of three items, then we want another paragraph, we want a block quote, we want a table, yeah? These are page structures, aren't they? How we display them is entirely up to you. A list view, <coughs> a bulleted list, could display as a bulleted list, but it could also display as a drop-down menu. That's down to the style that we apply to it. And that's why when we come to do the style in the second week, you're not allowed to touch your HTML. I want you to very clearly see the difference between the two, the two, the two tools. Now, <clears throat> if you don't specify a style sheet, the browser gives you a default style sheet. And that's, the, that's why you get these Times New Roman fonts in black and you get these horrible spaces between paragraphs and the headings are enormous and the paragraphs are small. This is the browser imposing its own font on your page, which we don't want. So let's, let's, let's break apart an HTML element. HTML elements have an opening tag and a closing tag, or they have an opening tag with a special pre-closer on the end. <coughs> Some elements don't contain content. That one, the image tag, there's no closing tag, there's nothing between the opening and closing tag, there's no text to this space, there's nothing there, is there? Whereas this one, I've got the heading one tag there, I close it over here, and that's the contents of the tag. So the top one, top tag has content, and the bottom tag has no content, it simply has attributes. And an attribute contains information about the content rather than the content. So in the previous example, the word engineering and computing is the content, isn't it? Because that's what you want to display. In this one, this is simply saying that's the file name you want to display. That's about the information, isn't it? It's not the actual thing we're displaying. It tells us what the thing is called. So there we are. So an image tag, source equals ec.jpg. It doesn't display ec.jpg. It displays the image called ec.jpg. That's why we put it as an attribute. We also have some awesome, cool new tags now, some elements. In HTML5, we have an audio <coughs> tag and a video tag. We haven't got to embed things in Flash Player anymore. Not required. We can simply enclose our media inside a pair of audio tags or a pair of video tags. We put some source tags in there, so different browsers support different formats. So uh, Chrome supports OG, for instance whereas uh, Firefox supports, sorry, Chrome supports, H, supports MP3. So if you've got different file types for different browsers, you simply have multiple source tags inside your audio or video tags. <clears throat> there you are, look, you see? Video. Every browser supports MP4 apart from Chrome, which doesn't. Chrome supports WebM. So therefore, all we have to do there's my video, there's my poster image, the, the image that appears before I play the video, there's my width and my height, and there's my source, type equals video mp4, so browsers that understand that will simply load that video, browsers that understand WebM will load the second video. So really simple, if you've ever done old fashioned HTML before with the video and audio, you realise how much nicer this is. <clears throat> there's audio, look. So OG is Chrome, and MPEG is MP3, pretty much everybody else. So you just simply put them in there. <coughs> um, this gives me the controls, the play and the re play rewind buttons on it, overlay. If I left that bit out, it would just play the audio file. <coughs> and here are the new tags that you need to be aware of for, your, for working with HTML5. <coughs> we have header tags. Header tags mean the header of our page, that with our title and our stuff, we put them in the header tag. And when we do the style sheet, we can apply style to the header. There's a footer tag to put things like, you know, about us, uh, extra information in, in that bottom tag. That's quite new. We have a section tag. So if, you're, if you've got content, say lots of articles on the page, you can put each one inside the section tag. And then we can apply style to the section tags to display the information. Um, articles. So we've got sections, we've got articles, we've even got an aside tag. You know how sometimes in magazines you have like uh, pull quotes? 
you know, where you have like an article and it pulls a sentence out or a quote and puts it in, in bold, you can wrap some of your text inside the aside, in, in the side tags and in your style sheet you can rip it out and display it like a magazine article down the side of the page. So the easy, these were designed to make life easier for you. It's, it was 12 years between HTML4 and HTML5. Half the life of the web, we were stuck with HTML4. So this has made things much easier for us. <clears throat> when you build your HTML, you need to make sure it's valid. Sometimes it displays in the web browser, but there might be errors in the HTML. The problem is, in a desktop web browser like I'm using here, the browser is big enough and powerful enough to correct the errors so the page still looks okay. But a smartphone web browser doesn't have that sort of power to make, error, make corrections to the mistakes. So it will look fine on the desktop web browser, but on a tablet or a phone, it will look messy. So there's a special tool at validator.wc.org which allows you to upload your HTML file and it will tell you if there's any errors in the file. And it's always a good idea to test your HTML to make sure you haven't made any stupid errors. I still do occasionally. <clears throat> and there we are. You simply browse your file, you click on check, and if there are any errors, it will list them and explain what line they're on and what the problem is. So the W3C validator is a really powerful tool. You should be using it all the time. There's one warning on that one for some reason. I didn't do a very good job of that. Okay, so HTML is actually pretty simple stuff, isn't it? There's not much to, to it at all. When we get on to CSS, though, this is where it gets more interesting because you've just defined the structure of your page, haven't you? You've said, I want a heading, big heading, main heading here, that's heading one. I want a subheading here, I want a paragraph here, I want a header, I want a footer. But we haven't said anything about how it's going to look. CSS is a style sheet. It's a separate file, well, as we're going to do it, and it defines the appearance of the web page. Which means you can have the same HTML and apply different style sheets to it to make it look completely different. And there's a site called zengarden.com. Have you come across that before? Zen Garden is for style sheet experts and they're given a fixed HTML document that you're not allowed to change. And they've got to turn it into something amazing. And if you look on there, all the examples they give, and there's hundreds of them which look completely different from each other, are all based on exactly the same HTML. It hasn't changed. And there's a heading, a subheading, a couple of paragraphs, an image or two, and that's it. <coughs> so we have a new file for this and we link the file into our HTML document. And what we do, we group, we, 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 set, we set aside a series of rules for our, for our HTML. <coughs> First of all, we define a selector. And at the simplest level, that P means this style applies to all tags of type P, in other words, paragraph tags. So I'm making all my paragraphs 12 point red all of them in any documents I link to. So I can be consistent, can't I? I can make sure every paragraph looks the same in my entire website. So this is the selector and this is a declaration. Again, technical terminology. The declaration, name is colour and the value is red. The declaration, name is font size and the value is 12 point. So I'm applying a series of declarations to a selector. <clears throat> so this is the syntax. This, this, by the way, this can be on multiple lines. I tend to put the curly brace and the, and the selector on one line. My, each of my, each, each of my, each, each of my, my um, um, properties and values on a line with themselves, and the closing brace on a different line. But this is, this is the syntax. So there's my selector. I have a curly brace. I put all my properties and values in with semicolons between them and I finish with a curly brace at the end. And that's the syntax. That's all you need to know about the basic syntax for CSS. There you are, that's how I do mine, look. Just to make it easier to read. And what some people do is, because this is longer, they put the colon across and line up the colons. Yeah, because the white space doesn't matter. You can put as much white space as you want. It's just like, um, just like C++. Yes, white space doesn't matter. If you put a semicolon at the end of the last one, you can, it doesn't matter. I tend to do it anyway, just in case I add some more afterwards. <coughs> there are three types of style sheet. 
the syntax is always the same you can actually build we can use a built-in style sheet that's built into the web browser we can use a user style sheet have you anyone done that before People with visual impairments do it. What you can do, you can actually load a style sheet into your web browser itself in the settings, in the browser settings. So if there's no supplied style sheet, it will use the one you provided. So if you need your characters to be bigger or certain colours, you can set that up in your web browser and it will override whatever's on the web page. And then the author style sheet is what we're doing. That's applying style to our web pages. OK, three ways you add a style sheet. First two are bad, last one's good. You can put the style inside a style attribute, look, inside the tag. H1 style equals colour red font size 16 point. That's bad, isn't it? Because that means every paragraph, every heading body you've now got to do separately. You've got to copy and paste. The other option is in the head section, you can put a pair of style tags in the head section and add your style sheet information inside there. But that means you've got to have a, a new one for every single page, isn't it? And you're increasing this, this, the size of the page. The best way is in the header section, put a link in. And link to a separate style sheet file. And in our case, it's style.css, which means when it gets to that line, it loads the contents of style.css into your web page and uses all the style you've defined. If you do it that way, you put that link into every page. If you want to change the paragraphs from 11 point to 12 point, across your entire website, you simply go into the style sheet file and make one small change. And that will cascade across the whole of your website. Right, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna whiz through these, okay? I'll put the presentation on Moodle so you can have another look in more detail. This is more detail about style sheets. <coughs> There's different sorts of selectors. I've shown you this one, haven't I? An element style selector, where you specify the element name as a selector and then it applies it to all the heading ones or all the paragraph tags that's the sort of standard way you do it most of the time that's what you need to do i'll show you the other ones because you'll come across problems when you do your designs where you can't figure out how to solve it <clears throat> this is cool class if you want certain paragraphs for example to be a certain style you put a class attribute in and then in your style sheet you put a dot so I can apply the style now to all the paragraphs with a class of quote. So I can be more selective now about how I apply the style to different parts of my web page by, by using this class selector. <clears throat> IDs. An ID is unique. An ID is an identifier for a particular tag on the page. Whereas you can use the same class multiple times on the page. You should only ever use the one ID once. Every ID on the page should be different. So years ago, if you had a header, it would be div ID equals header. And then you'd apply the style to that. So a, a class allows you to apply, you can use the same class multiple times in your document. An ID must be unique. So uh, ID column one, ID column two are typical examples. We don't use them as much as we used to. This is even cooler. <coughs> you, can make, you can attach style based on the selector. Sorry, not an attribute. So look, href means any element that has an href attribute gets that style. It's a bit more obscure, but it's sort of useful. This says any image tag with an alt attribute gets that style. This is even cooler. href hat equals HTTP. That matches all elements that contain an external link, one that has the full HTTP code on slash slash, you know, the whole, the whole thing. <clears throat> Source dollar equals PNG, whoops, matches any image element that displays a PNG. So there's loads of ways you can, you, can, you can attach style to different parts of your page. You should never ever need to modify the HTML. There's always a way of doing this. There's a pseudo class. You know when you have links on your page and you, you hover over them with your mouse pointer? A colon hover applies style when you hover over something. Okay, that's quite clever, isn't it? 
And look at this one. A nth child even. So if you've got 10 bullet points, it'll apply the style to the second, the fourth, the sixth, and the eighth, and the tenth. So you can have stri stripy effects on your tables, for instance. So there's loads. Use this as a reference, please, when you're working on your style sheets. <clears throat> so you do elements. You want a big first letter in your, in your paragraph? You've got it. P, first letter. H, first line. So if you want all your lines indented, apart from the first one, you can indent them all and remove the indent from the first one. So there's no need to add complicated syntax to the HTML now to be able to, to, to create the appearance. <clears throat> you can even apply the same style sheet to more than one element. So this one applies the same style to H1, comma H2, H3. So all three will get the same style. Commas are really important, by the way, because... Oops, sorry, I missed the slide out there. If you don't put commas in, it means something completely different. If I didn't put commas in, it would say, find any H3s which are inside an H2 tag, which is inside an H1 tag, which, which makes no sense, does it? If you're talking about bulleted lists, you'd say OLLI, which means all the list items inside an ordered list. So if, if you miss the commas out, it's a nesting. It's the nesting approach. If you put commas in, it's each individual element. I think I'm going to do this. I might leave this till next time. No, I won't. I can't. It's too long talking about, about the assignment. <clears throat> Web typography. Your assignment this week is purely about producing the web pages and improving the typography of the page, the fonts, the colours, how it looks, you know, the 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 the, the uh, typography of it. <coughs> <coughs> when you look at your CSS properties, there are font properties, font size, font family, for instance, which refer to the general characteristics, and there's text properties. Start with text dash in your CSS. Best thing to do is look at, this, look at some CSS references and pick these out and see what they do. Specifying the font. I'm just about going to make it, I think. Right. The final challenge for your lab this week is I want you to use custom fonts in your web page. Now, until HTML5, you couldn't do it. Because the problem was the browser used the fonts that were installed on the computer. So if you wanted to use a Trebuchet AMS in your web page and someone had the installed Office, it didn't use Trebuchet AMS, it ignored it. If you wanted to use uh, Monaco, okay, which is quite a specialist font, and, your, and the person who looked at your web page hadn't got Monaco installed, it would ignore it and use something else. So when we specify fonts, we specify font families. So in this example, I want to use the Verdana font. If it can't find Verdana, it will just ignore it and use Times New Roman. This one, I want to use Times New Roman. And because it has spaces, I have to have quotes around it. In this one, I'm saying, I want to use Verdana. If you haven't got Verdana installed, use Arial. If you haven't got Arial installed, you really are on an old computer. Use any sans serif font. So it cascades, you see this, it's a family. Use this, else use this, else use this, like an if-else statement. And the last option, you should always put a generic family. Serif, sans serif, for instance. However, we can install our own fonts. If you can find a true type font for the font you want, a TTF font, which is everywhere, aren't they? Free downloads. All you have to do is put this in your style sheet near the top. That's the magic ingredient. You specify, you give it a font family name so you can refer to it later on in your, when you do your font families later on, and you simply put the, put the name of the file, name of the true type file. And if you do that, you can use any font you want. You just gotta make sure the font is uploaded to, the, uploaded to your web server, uploaded to your, uh, your project. And what I've done here, this is, the, this is the ultimate. Font family funky. If you can't find funky, use Comic Sans MS. And if you can't find that, use cursive. Cursive is, you know, just a generic curly script. 
we still need fallback because not all browsers support this font face. All modern browsers support font face, but if someone's on IE6, for instance, it won't support it, or IE7. But if the person's using the modern web browser, all web browsers now support this approach. There you are, font family, font size, font style, font weight, font face, font size adjust, font stretch, <coughs> and so on and so forth. I put all the common ones you're ever going to need in the presentation. So you can refer to that as a refer to that as you do your work. Okay, now there are three ways you can name colours in your web pages, because you have to put colours in your web page for this week. There are 147 named colours. Here we are, khaki, red, corn silk, green, cyan. Okay, if you want to use those, you can use those. The second way is you can specify hex colours, you know RGB hex. Yeah, with a hash sign. Alternatively, you can use RGB colours. Instead of colour hash, it will be colour RGB, then the red, the green and the blue. 